what I wanted to ask you, Gav, was what was the first film you saw growing up that caused you to think, hang on a minute, I want to do that? Well, I never really had a film that made me do that. The thing that, I, yeah, when I look at my career trajectory, it's bounced all over the place. So I never kind of set out thinking, I want to do film, I've got to do film. Because, I mean, I grew up in Yorkshire in the 80s, and that stuff was so far out of reach that I never felt like I had a chance at ever doing any of that stuff anyway. So it wasn't, it honestly, wasn't on my radar. My whole kind of hopes and dreams growing up was comics, because I grew up with 2000 AD, and that was my whole thing growing up. And, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to be a comic artist. So I spent all my time practicing to draw comics and, you know, making up comics with my friends. And it's weird. Well, my friends, like one friend in particular, my friend Steve Sag, who now I'm working on a film with. <clears throat> so it's funny how these things kind of come round. Um, but I read this, what was it? It's something I heard on YouTube. And they said that um, they were talking about um, development of people, specifically artists and people that, um, that like create things. And they said that by the time you're 14 years old, you've basically locked in all the stuff that you love like you know what you like when you're 14 and whatever you like when you're 14 will play out in some way throughout the rest of your life and if you're in the business of creating things that will you know roll through in the way that you you know your, your career plays out and the more creative control you get presumably the more that's visible um and for me that was aliens like 14 years old watched aliens did change it changed my life um it was the first time I'd ever seen something that had everything I ever wanted in it. It had it had all the ingredients. Just check, 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 check. It's like if you did like a, a, a sort of a young Gav um, science fiction bingo, it's just full card. It's like it's all there. Like you can, you know, you've won. Uh, so that film was hugely important to me. And from that point onwards, like, you know, all the comics I was trying to draw, you know, everybody's got pulse rifles. Everybody looks like colonial marines. And then that was what, 85? And then a couple of years later, we had Robocop and Predator. And so they started turning up in my comics. <laughs> and so then it was like, hey, the aliens are fighting predators. Ah, here comes Robocop. You know, and I've still got all this stuff in the garage. That was me as a kid, just drawing all this stuff. <clears throat> and so, you know, I probably shouldn't be a huge surprise now that, uh, you know, sitting here now with you talking about this stuff, if I was talking about films that changed my life, it, it would be Aliens, but I didn't see that until I was 14. So it wasn't like I saw something as a tiny little kid. And it, it, I was like, oh, I've got to make films. I want to make films. Never really had that. I, there was something about Aliens that, when, when you, you, particularly when you're younger, when you see something and you really love it, you kind of want to just be close to it and absorb all the information about it. And kind of, if you're a creator, like an artist or whatever, you want to like, replicate it, right? It's probably the same with musicians, I imagine. You know, when you're younger and you first hear the Beatles you probably start trying to write Beatles songs and things like that I mean I don't know I imagine it's probably quite similar but um so for me I basically just wanted to like climb inside James Cameron's brain and just live there um and that gave me more of an appreciation of like the original Terminator when that first dropped in 1984 it was only like a year before but it wasn't it didn't have the same magnitude when it dropped as Aliens did so to be able to go back and then watch the Terminator and realize how awesome it was and properly appreciate it, and then followed by Terminator Two, and then you know just that whole period. James Cameron in the mid eighties. What a time to grow up, hey? I mean, I was there with you along the way, you know. What a time, bloody hell. Yeah, I mean, what do we have now, right? If you're um, fourteen now, like today, you're fourteen years old. What's what's doing that to your brain? What's what's getting in there and staying there? I mean, I'm sure there's something, but I don't know what that is right now. I'm, presumably it's in gaming. I mean, it's probably it's probably things like The Last of Us or it's particularly the first one. Uh, maybe things like Ghost of Tsushima or something. I mean, you know, these things that get in there and just stay there. So maybe if we're lucky in like 20, 25 years, we'll have a we'll be like pensioners and there'll be all these like younger guys making the samurai films and they'll be talking about how Ghost of Tsushima was the thing that they saw that just like, I've got to I've got to do this. I've got to do this. But yeah, I think it's all changed now because games are just so good. I mean, back when we were kids, like games were, you know, we we're playing on the ZX Spectrum. We we're playing things like, um, you know, Rebel Star and, you know, well, Spectrum games, basically 8-bit, early 8-bit stuff. Mm. Um, so yeah, 
yeah. I guess with comics, I completely it, forgotten what your question was. It was, yeah, it was just about the film. You answered it, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking yeah. that the comics were just accessible to you, I guess, in that you had a skill for drawing and you thought I can do that and I can jump into that world via that kind of medium. Yeah, it's different for me because I, I think living down here in London, I was always aware that like Star Wars was shot at Elstree, you know, and oh, that must have been magical. Aliens at Pinewood. And I used to go to the studios. I used to just sort of go and drive by them with my dad, you know, and just go, oh my God, that's where they made that thing. Just thought that there was this magical world on the other side of the fence. Comics weren't. Well, weirdly enough, I was going to say weirdly enough, like, because I was always striving for that kind of connection because I never had it. And I found out in subsequent years that, because I grew up in a little town called Elland in West Yorkshire, right? It's a little town. There's, it's hard to describe because there isn't like a oh, new Swift fire extinguishers had their original factory there. That was that's all there kind of is to really say about putting it on a map. Um, you know, it's like a nice little Yorkshire town. It's just one of those things where there isn't really a thing you can put a pin on and say, yeah, that's Elland. Um, so you know, I didn't have that whole kind of connection. Like you know, going to a film studio when I was a kid, I, I couldn't even imagine that ever being a thing. You know, but I found out in subsequent years. In Aliens, when Ripley is in the power loader fighting the Queen Alien, she's got, uh, there was like a, a, a power lift to do behind her built into the suit. And the, the suit was like, the suit itself was like a lot of like vacuum plastic painted up. And there was a guy like basically cuddling Sigourney Weaver from behind, like what an awesome job. And he's like walking the suit and they were like, you know, he's like taking his cues off her movements and feeling her leg move, movement. And it was like connected by the suit. And, you know, and that whole thing was just awesome finding out how they did it blew my mind as a kid but what i didn't realize is i had a friend because it's not a big it's not a big place island and i had a friend i went to school with and her parents had like a farm at the bottom of town and there was a little bit at the bottom of the town and there was like a little clump of like five or six farms next to each other and the guy her farming next door neighbor who had adjoining fields he was the guy who was inside the power loader <laughs> And if I'd have known that as a kid, I'd be round there, like, just, you know, <laughs> knocking on his door, wanting to talk to him about aliens, yeah, yeah. trying to kind of get closer to it somehow. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I had no idea that the guy that was in the power loader, like, just lived, like, down the street. That's very cool. I've heard that story before about that guy. As you say, what a job, you know. And that's the thing, isn't it? Talking to these people, as I have done on this podcast and in my other projects, just... It's, it's about trying to have that connection to those films that I love, you know. And I think what you've done is you've... You know, you've managed to sort of translate all of that love into your own films, which I think is is even more awesome. I mean, I will have introduced you, of course, as somebody who worked on Moon and did the production design and, and visual effects and, you know, was very close in the development and uh, the production and post-production and everything else about Moon. But can you just explain to the listeners how you ended up working with Duncan Jones and uh, getting Sam Rockwell on board and making this, I think it's a fantastic movie. I watch it at least twice a year since it's come out. Yeah, we did okay with Moon. It's cool that people um, like took it to the hearts like they did. I mean, you don't know that when you're making it, but you're just trying as hard as you can to make something with some value. So it means a lot that people responded to Moon and, and still kind of hold it hold it in high regard. It's cool. Because we had, we had no money when we were making that film. Um, I mean, what happened with me and Duncan getting together is we used to work together at a games company in the late nineties. And it was run by and owned by a chap called Demis Hasabis, who then went off um, in subsequent years to create Deep Mind, which created the AlphaGo software that beat the world champion at the uh, board game Go. So that was Demis. So that's actually Demis's fault that, you know, I mean, now he's like, you know, with Google and stuff, but it's Demis's fault that me and Duncan met because I was on the art team and Duncan came in as a writer and um yeah we 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 met at the games company and he wanted to make films he just finished film school and he wanted to be a director and i was working as an artist in a games company but always trying to do what i can to level up my art <clears throat> and this is back in like the late 90s when the runtime environments for games were like more, infinitely more primitive than they are now like you're making ps1 generation characters out of 250 polygons things like that so I was always trying to, I was working with 3D software, I was using 3D Studio Max, and it had all these powerful high-end functions in it that I never needed. And I used to play with them all the time because, you know, it's cool and you do all these cool graphics. And I was just mucking about at home doing things. And so, yeah, working with Duncan, like just mucking about on things basically was just, firstly, it was a way for me to have a, a good reason to work with all the more powerful tools and just level up. Um, and so we, 
yeah, we ended up moving in together so we could just work on stuff all the time. And um, then we both ended up going freelance. So we would basically do freelance jobs to pay our bills and then just spend the rest of our time trying to trying to make a film, basically. We just teamed up. <coughs> oh, excuse me. So, you know, he was trying to get established as a, as a director. And, you know, that's it's hard for anybody, no matter when they do it. But it was just endless pitches for things um, for like low budget or zero budget music promos. And they'd send you a track and you you know, Duncan would write, but we'd talk about it, we'd come up with some ideas. I might do a bit of artwork to support it, put a treatment together, we'd submit it. And it was just pass, 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 pass. And we had about like, I don't know, I think it was 48 straight rejections. And it was just like, I remember we were both pulling our hair out and it was like, is this ever going to change? Like, what is this whole thing? Because Duncan kept trying to make films. So all of his treatments were little stories and the music people weren't really interested in that. They wanted like high concept visual stuff. Um, and in the end, we started swinging it around towards that and it started working and we got some traction. Um, but yeah, I remember I remember up one night talking about this and I was just saying like, you need to, we need to stop stop trying to make a film every time somebody comes at us with a 3000 quid music promo. Cause it's just not, no one wants that. You know, we need to get a bit more high concept with stuff and, and get more visual with it and, you know, find find another another in. So yeah, we, we did that. We had a, um, some success with the, um, uh, la, 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 what was the track called? Groove Colors. It was a, low, a really, really low budget promo we shot with a couple of girls fighting. And that ended up being remade into a, um, a commercial for French Connection for television years later. So basically we got some traction and we ended up doing all kinds of working our way up. We were doing like test commercials, this, that and the other. And we ended up getting to the point where we were doing like, you know, 250 grand television commercials, which is awesome. Um, so yeah, and it was just like me and him working at home, really. He'd be writing things, I'd be doing a lot of artwork to just kind of support pitch stuff. And then we, yeah, we started, he had a short film that he had to make to fully graduate from film school. So I was like, I made all the props, design stuff. We just talked about things all the time, put all of our ideas together. He'd go off and write stuff. We, it was just basically like a cycle of like cups of tea in the kitchen, back to our computers to work, cups of tea in the kitchen and just doing that all the time. It was a good way of working. We got tons of stuff done. But on top of it all was always like, make a film, make a film, let's make a sci-fi film. And the more success we got, the more um, kind of energized we got that we were going to be able to pull it off one day if we just kept working. So we're seeing a trajectory change. So that was probably around the first time I started properly thinking about film in any real sense. I had, um, I mean, we're always talking about it, but, you know, you talk about things. We were talking about doing a game as well. I mean, we had a, a thing we were doing where we, at one point we were um, talking to Lego and we almost, um, had a um we actually did have the opportunity we turned it down we passed on it but we were all set to basically set up a game studio and do a game for lego and we ended up passing on it because we were like if we stick at this film stuff we might be able to crack mm. it so we were like if we do this we've got to fully commit to it and it'll totally derail all the ideas we've got for film stuff so we ended up backing away from that and fully pursuing it and it was one of those things where you know, you, you you sort of say no, you're like, sorry, yeah, thank you, but we're not going to be doing that. And then you're just thinking, Jesus, so I just ruined my life. <laughs> yeah. You know, and you've got that that stressful period of turning down something awesome and just feeling weird about it for a yeah. couple of months. Yeah. So, yeah, I've had a couple of those. You always feel weird. But the little voice tells you what to do. You've got to listen to the little voice. Um. So where am I now? That got Yeah, so that got me thinking properly about film. And it, it always seemed so kind of far away because fair enough, me and Duncan are like best friends living together in a house, putting all our ideas together. All of a sudden, these things are all happening. We're kind of shooting stuff every month or two. We're like, you know, we're on sets all the time. Things are happening. But we're not, you know, we're not um, outside in Winnebago's with, you know, <clears throat> sat there in, on a crane with megaphones and talking to, talking to Bruce Willis and stuff like that's not, you know, that wasn't it at mm. all. But you couldn't denying that something was happening, but it wasn't making films. And it still always seemed really elusive to me. And in 2003, I think it must have been, I had a really interesting sort of pivot in my kind of thinking where a friend of mine um, saw an ad on the early internet. It must have been quite early internet back then. And it was before we had all the kind of forum culture and stuff that we have today. And the the organization of fan bases and stuff. And it was just a little ad, I don't remember where I saw it. And it said, uh, do you want to be a zombie in a film? And so, you know, 
send us an mm-hmm. email. So he, he calls me and he's like, I've seen this actually, we're going to be zombies in films. And we both grew up with the Mero films, yeah. like loved Dawn of the Dead, Day of mm-hmm. the Dead, you know, totally into it. Saw the saw this ad, we're like, yeah, of course I want to be zombies in films. So we answered the ad and it, um, the whole thing was um, go along to, uh, went to the Soho Laundry, I think it was in Soho, Chinese Laundry, whatever it's called in Soho. Remember what it's called hmm. we went in there. there's like um rooms you can hire out for stuff and had a zombie audition and it's like okay there's a whole bunch of people in a room and there's you know four people sat behind a table and they're like okay be a zombie go <laughs> and everyone just it was night you know it was in a room with no windows everyone's just going uh, just like <laughs> shambling around and it was funny because you could see like you could see some people and it's like you're going for bub and it was like, Bub seemed a bit inappropriate because Bub's an intelligent zombie, relatively speaking. And Bub's, Bub does his best stuff by himself, not in a room with other zombies. So I remember there's there's somebody who was doing a Bub. And I remember thinking, like, you, you're blowing it. Like, that's, yeah. not, that's the wrong zombie to go for. You want to go generic zombie, I'm going to eat your brains. Like, that's what you want right now. And he didn't he didn't get it. And his Bub was quite good, but he was, like, look, standing around looking at things and stuff. And I could see what he's doing, but it's like, nah. They're not, they're not looking for feature zombies here. They're looking yeah, for yeah. a bunch of people to be in a crowd. Um, so I ended up getting it, and I was like, well, I passed an audition. There's a there's a, there's a a switch. I wasn't expecting that. So all of a sudden, me and my mate Ed, like, were in a film. So <clears throat> we got a, we got an email through asking us to go out to New Cross for uh, four or five days and night shoots, which was – and at the time, I was running a team doing a bunch of outsourcing for – the, we were making the vehicles for the Xbox SKU at Grand Theft Auto 3. Mm. So it was quite a cool job we were doing. Um, and I had like a little company that I'd set up and I was running teams doing freelance jobs. I was pretty knackered. I'd, I'd been just in the grind for quite a while. So I left the whole thing with my mate Kev Duffy to, to run that whilst I stepped out to have a little mini break and work on this film. So we turned up for four days of night shoots. Totally awesome. We're all there, dressed as zombies. You know, you turn up when it's still daylight, <clears throat> spend a couple of hours getting made up and just waiting. And it gets dark and, you know, you're on set and you're all shooting. Mm. And it turned out it's the space guys running around. And we, it, the film was Shaun of the Dead, but none of us knew what was going on back then. We All we knew was like, oh, look, cool. It's the space guys making a zombie film. That's awesome. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I was on Shaun of the Dead as a zombie for, uh, for a few days. And then at the time I had like short blonde hair and uh, I looked quite a lot like Simon. Right, yeah. And I got pulled out of the I got pulled out of the crowd and asked to double for him. So I was like, yeah, cool. So then I, I ended up going down to Ealing Studios and doing a lot of stuff down there. And just basically um yeah like standing in for Simon and just being right there in the middle of Shaun of the Dead being shot like right next to the camera for like a few weeks. And it was it was brilliant. <laughs> I tell it, you what, if I'm gonna can I use a swear word? Yeah, go for it, yeah. Okay. It was fucking brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it was. It was it was amazing yeah because you know i'm all of a sudden i'm there right in the middle of this production i mean artistically contributing next to nothing just standing where i'm told and doing what i'm told and that's basically it but just being in the middle of it and watching watching these people work like because mm. being duncan at that time you know we we had a couple of false starts trying to make a sci-fi film but that was still our whole thing and all of a sudden i'm on set of this of the space guys doing a zombie film and <laughs> you could tell when he was shooting it there's something going on there. Like mm. I've been on a lot of sets and some sets they don't, the way I kind of um, categorize them, it's like you can have a day on set and it's always cool being on a set. Cause usually, you, you know, there are like sets that have been built and there's actors in costume and stuff, mm. but some of them, they're not equal. Like some sets are a lot better than other sets. Mm. And some sets really leave you with something in your head when you walk away um there's always interesting things going on but some of them have just got there's a thing about it and you're like i want to see what that ends up looking like Mm. and the pub stuff when they were shooting all the pub stuff with the zombies coming in and you know i had to do a load of standing stuff like holding the rifle and all that and they you know all that's cool fun but doing all of that you just knew that there was something going on there like that was going to be good like there was a thing happening there and it looked like it was going to be good so I was getting very excited about that. And every day I'd come home and I'd talk to um, I'd talk to Duncan about what had been going on that day. And I remember he was quite jealous about it because, you know, <laughs> he was just at home and I'm off, you know, on the Space Guy zombie film. <laughs> <laughs> but it was amazing. And it, it, just watching those guys work, it demystified a lot for me. I've basically spent my whole career having things demystified. But just watching, watching like Edgar and Simon, like talking about things next to the camera whilst they're working out a scene, it was just so like reasonable what they were doing, mm, like because mm. they're just they're just 
a pair of very intelligent, highly um, creative people that work creatively at a very high level, mm. just having very um, kind of blunt conversations with each other. And those those really good creative conversations where people aren't shy about just being quiet for a minute whilst they think about what they want to say. Mm. And it's not mm. awkward. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Seeing all of that going on was just, it was very, very, um, it was very cool. Uh, very inspiring, really inspiring. Yeah, it gave you the sort of impetus to think I could be in that position, you know, in the future. Not really, because I still wasn't. I was still wasn't thinking like that. What it mm. was, I was watching them talk, and I was thinking, this is how me and Duncan talk about stuff. Mm. There isn't some witchcraft going on here. There isn't some unknown element. Like there are a couple of couple of guys that have totally got their heads in the moment, uh, problem solving, like on the feet. And it was just, you know, it's what I mean. Anybody who's worked on new production has probably got experience of doing that. And watching these guys do it was cool because it was like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm, we're not. It's not like they're doing some magical stuff that we don't know about. It's like, I mean, what they're doing was like awesome. It was all very well planned and very well executed. But I understood it all. I could see what was going on. You know, you see the makeup queue. You've been in the makeup queue. You've all been made up. You, you, you can see it all. You know how to build the sets. You know, you, you know what's going on. Like you can see what's happening. You understand the time scales things take. You know, you're watching, watching the machine move, and yeah. it was just super cool being right in the middle of it. And I mean, I was just there working as a as a stand in the middle of it all. So it was what was really cool was that I didn't, I could just observe. Like, you know, as long as I was listening to my radio and I was where I needed to be when I needed to be, um, I could just observe everything um which is a kind of luxury you don't normally get when you're working because normally you've got your tunnel vision on to some degree and mm. you kind of bring your head up now and again and look around and then you're back in again mm. whereas with this i was just like um yeah i was almost like a tourist it was great <laughs> yeah that sounds like an awesome experience and then you kind of start developing moon with with duncan over these coffees yeah. in the kitchen and just kind of you know throwing ideas in and and just i guess each of these projects that you've worked on, you know, whether it's a game or whether it's a film or your short film, you have to come up with like a little kernel of an idea, don't you, initially? What was the sort of jumping yeah. off point for Moon? Moon came together really through um, re a realistic appraisal of our situation and trying to manage expectations. Because what happens is ambition it's a very natural thing for anyone in any creative field and your ambition comes in all by itself. So I find with this stuff, you don't really need to worry about being ambitious. What I find is if you start with something doable, then it, the ambition will kind of balloon. It's almost like if you imagine you've got a fish tank and a, and a balloon, a big balloon, and you were blowing up the balloon and you wanted to make it as big as you could. If, the, if you just blow up the balloon and stop blowing it, you'll just have a big balloon. Mm. But, you know, if it's like in a fish tank, if you blow it up, it'll like fill out all the corners and like max it all out. Just kind of think of it like that, where sci-fi films, like one of the original things we got going on early on, it was going to cost like, you know, over a hundred million dollars. And I think when everybody starts making film, they're kind of naive enough to think that that's reasonable. Like you walk in as a, as a nobody with a, a bunch of nice artwork and you just think someone's going to give you a load of money because they're going to buy into it. This doesn't happen like that. Like you've got to prove yourself first. I mean, understand that now, of course, but yeah, we didn't we didn't understand that at the time really. Uh, and we th basically we were pulling our hair out. We'd had a couple of false. I remember I remember this really well. It was me and Duncan. We're in the lounge of the of the flat. We were we'd moved into another house and we had like a a, um, a more creative kind of hub thing going on. And um, yeah, we were just really really pissed off. We were really down about it. it was, this must have been like two thousand and five maybe yeah it must be like maybe mid to late 2005 and we were just like it's never gonna what we're gonna do how's this gonna work like how's this you know what we're we doing wrong it's just not gonna work this whole thing's like it's, we're just having a real down moment and <clears throat> basically we just sat there and we we're like you know what what can we get like we've done some stuff we know some people you know what can we get what can we what let's figure out what we can get and we'll make something for that and we'll just try as hard as we can and but we'll, we can move forwards. Like we're not going to be in this because it almost feels like I kind of, I'm sure anyone who's trying to get films made will kind of get this, you know, like sharks can only breathe when they move. You know, it's like if you hold a start of sharks still in the water, apparently they suffocate because they need the yeah. movement through the water mm -hmm. of the gills to be able to extract the oxygen and breathe. So I always felt like that, like make, when you're really trying to make something like things have to move. Mm -hmm. There's a feeling of just nothing happening. It's just suffocating. 
Um, and that's what we felt like. And it can be quite bad for your creativity too, because it's probably the time you need to be the most creative. And it's probably the time you feel the least creative. So, you know, you, we just, I mean, fortunately we were just too stupid to not give up. So yeah. we just kept at it. Yeah. And I mean, at the end of the day, the rationale behind it was always that, so how I always felt as a comic artist when I was a kid, you know, I was growing up in Yorkshire, I wanted to be a comic artist and everybody at school was trying to talk me out of it. Like the careers teachers, all the tutors and stuff, teachers, and they were like, well, it's impossible being a comic artist. And, you know, how many people work as a comic artist? It's like virtually impossible. Just give up. Like they just wanted numbers. I mean, I get it. Like they wanted pupils in jobs. Yeah. And the local big employer was the Halifax Building Society. And they hoovered up anybody with A-levels in any nearby school. Yeah. So they were like, OK, what you want to do is either go to the Halifax Building Society. Or I was in the Air Cadets and I was doing some flying and stuff. And they were like, OK, REF, Halifax Building Society. Good. That's you done. <laughs> Uh, you know, next child. And I was like, no, <laughs> I want to draw comics. And I, I remember getting into all kinds of, I remember in the end, I stopped, go, we were supposed to have these little meetings and I stopped going to them because they just weren't listening to me. And I was like, we've, there's nothing to talk about. You know, we've had like three or four career meetings. We keep saying the same stuff, mm. not into it. And fortunately, my mum and dad were like, because I just used to draw comics all the time at home. And my mum and dad saw this and they believed enough in me to say, look, if you want to go to art school, if you can get yourself in with a portfolio, you can live here and we'll support you whilst you go to art mm. school because there's a really good course in Leeds which was like on a train you know trainable mm -hmm. so they they were like you know I was like okay cool I got my mum and dad on board like screw these careers guys it doesn't matter so um I just my rationale was that every week I read 2000 AD like they've got loads of artists working there like and they're rotating and there's new artists coming in all the time like must be possible it must be and I'm just not accepting the fact these guys are telling me it's it's bollocks. It's like, if it really, really is impossible, I'll find out myself when the editor from 2000 AD just tells me to flat out fuck off, stop sending him submissions yeah. and go and die in a fire. Then <laughs> I'll maybe accept that it's impossible. But until that point, I'm going to, you know, going to try yeah. and be a comic artist. So that was, I don't know. I mean, I'm not saying this is good advice necessarily, but it just... Other people all over the world achieve difficult things every day. Yeah. If you think directing a film is like an impossible feat, like, I mean, it's not easy. Don't get yeah. me wrong. It's not easy. But my rationale for that is that every day all over the world, people are directing films. Now, am I so special and so unique that I must be excluded from the possibility of ever achieving that? Do you know what I mean? Because I would have yeah, to be yeah. such a unique snowflake to not have the slightest chance of accomplishing what literally tens of thousands of other people accomplish every day all over the world. Do you know what I mean? So that was yeah. the thing that kind of kept the light on for me. I've always kind of had that as a, it's like other people do it. So if I definitely, definitely can't, whilst I'm working all the time to try and do it, if I'm definitely not able to do that, then that puts me in my own special bracket somehow. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. With even yeah. bigger odds. So yeah, I've always just kind of framed it like that. And it, 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 yeah, it's always just kind of kept me at it, really. Which, like I said, I'm not saying this is like ideal career advice, but that's what I did. Yeah. And I don't regret that. I mean, I can't say that would necessarily apply to everybody, but I seem to have figured it out just by, you know, just grinding and not giving yeah. up, basically. Everybody I've spoken to that's been in the film industry, whether it's you know, Paul Hirsch who edited Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back and Ferris Bueller or Evil Powell who produced you know, Alien and Blade Runner or Robert Watts who was a producer for Lucas, they've all of them have said they've had a little bit of luck, lots of passion and just this bloody mindedness, this kind of tenacity to just, no, I am going to fucking do this. This is what I want to do. Um, yeah, and, and all looks of them, important. Yeah. Looks important because like, yeah. you know, half of everything really is luck. And you know what? If you get some luck, good for you. Take it. Don't feel bad. Don't um and ah over it. Take it and, and push it forwards. Nothing to feel bad about. Because if you're trying to do if you try to do something for a long time, the time will usually give you some luck at some point. You have bad luck too, of course. And that's why you shouldn't really get down about it, because it's just the universe playing its numbers game. But if you can stay in the running and keep going at it sooner or later, you'll have some luck. How do you manage that kind of up and down? Because I guess with, you know, if we take the example of a film like Moon, you're trying to get it off the ground. You know, you're having difficulties in doing so. You get Sam Rockwell on board. I'm not sure the timeline of this, Gav, but, you, you know, you have money, then you run out of money. And then, you know, you have these massive highs and these massive lows. What do you do to sort of 
try and stay on the level. Yeah, this was a big thing for me, actually, because I could feel my emotions swinging around. And I know, understand that's not a good thing to go through because it's almost like um, it's almost like when you accept praise, like, you know, I mean, it's nice, but it, you can't soak it all the way in, because if you do, it means that if somebody says something negative about you, then that's going to soak all the way in. So you almost I mean, my take on it is that I know that I'm working as hard as I can on whatever I'm doing. And I can explain why I did what I did if I need to, and I can defend my artistic decisions. Um, and it's all thought about. It's all, you know, it's all. It all comes from a, um, a, some kind of a plan that I'm rolling out. Like when I'm working on jobs, you know, I know, I know why I'm making the decisions I'm making. And so beyond that, you know, there's obviously a matter of taste. Like not everything's going to be to everybody's taste. Um, and so there's nothing you can do about that. Like, you know, I'm going to try as hard as I can on my work, but. There's going to be some people out there that will think that everything I do is just trash just through um, the mechanics of the universe again and you know how, how it all works like taste but there'll be some other people out there that will think it's cool you know what can I tell you it's like it's the same for everybody if you're mm -hmm. writing a song like whatever you're doing you write a song and someone listens to it and goes yeah it's boring it doesn't necessarily mean your song is boring. It means they found it boring for whatever reason. They might have been, they might have been watching uh, TV whilst they were listening to it. It could be any, you know, it could be anything. Just it doesn't mean that that's necessarily the right thing. And conversely, when someone comes up to you and says that's the best song I've ever heard in my entire life, it's the best song anyone's ever written. Cool that they enjoy it, but you can't then sort of inwardly think I've written the best song anybody's ever written <laughs> that would be seem to be a mistake right yeah and so I yeah I felt this when when we were doing moon because we had four times on the production when we ran out of money and when I say run out of money I mean if a check doesn't clear in the morning everything's getting put in a skip and we're all going home we had that four times um that stuff really messes with your emotions because it's like we're on we're on we're on it's gone it's gone it's all in the trash it's all in the skip we're on we're saved and that stuff can really mess with you so what i um how i dealt with that was um basically taking control of my emotions is what i did i consciously when something happened and it's difficult because you're in a room with people jumping up and down like punching the air like when you get saved and i deliberately made it my mental business and my mental health to not jump in the air and punch the, you know jump up and down and punch the air because it might all be in the bin again tomorrow and then it might get saved again the day after that and so what I did was just kept focus on the work I knew that I had my own corner and I could do everything I could to support that the, the broader side of things like hey we've run out of money we need some finance I can't do anything about that so it's almost like the universe is grinding its own cogs i'm talking about universe a lot today um and there's not much i can do about that i can keep my own corner up and do what i can to keep everybody's spirits up around me um and just just try and be that guy that is just like you know i want to say try and be the rock it's not quite what i mean i guess i guess it is kind of what i mean but i don't really see myself like that but i was just trying to not be the one who ever gets excessively happy or ever gets excessively down and this was a conscious thing that I spent quite a bit of time working on to be able to do this. And the reason why, how I achieved it was by looking at the broader context of everything that we've done. And it was like, we're still here. We're still going to be here tomorrow. Whatever happens, okay, supposing the worst thing does happen and the film goes down. We're all healthy. Our brains are still working. You know, we've learned loads through the, pro you know, we can, we can figure it out. And I was just, it was just about having faith in ourselves that we would be able to figure something out no matter what, even if it was a setback and something really bad happened, we'll figure it out, we'll take a deep breath, you know, we'll go and have a sandwich, we'll sort it out, we've got this far by sorting things out, sorting ourselves out, we'll, we can do that in the future, we'll continue to do that. So what I found was over time it worked, and I found that I'm now able to do this, and I've been through this with the release of an archive, you know, you get a good review and it's like, you know, the first review I ever saw was like a, a 10 stars. And I was like, holy shit, this is awesome. Second review was um, uh, four out of five. So straight away, I'm averaging it going, okay, that's, if I average that out, that's a, 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 a 10 out of 10 and an eight out of 10, that gives us a nine. All right. And then you read another one and someone someone doesn't like it and they give you a, a 
but you know give you like a three star out of five or something and that's a bad review all of a sudden and you're like shit shit i'm flipping my average is slipping oh my god my world's falling apart this whole thing's fucked and i can't have that i can't have myself thinking like that but it's the first thing that happens like these thoughts come into your brain then you've got to push them out box them up deal with them put parcel it up with a little bowl on it and shove it in the mail you know and make sure it's make sure it's all contextualized so i can actually do that now which is um it's cool but there's a, a kind of a, a side effect to that which is you never really get the big highs of a super awesome cool thing happening you don't get that euphoric lift because i've kind of drilled that out of myself but i also don't get the plummeting lows that come from some like when i'm working like some sudden bad news you know i'm, I'm able to maintain um a steady through line which is really important and I did have a couple of times on archive where people are like, I'd have thought that I'd have spun you out. And it's like, look, we'll just figure it out. And it's because I've been training myself to do this for the last 10 years now and I can do it. But what it does do is it replaces, it replaces those like euphoric highs with a nice cozy, cozy, warm glow, which stays for a lot longer, which now I've experienced that I'll take that any day of the week, like a nice, satisfying warm glow it's like it's like leaning next to a radiator on a cold day in front of a window oh, yeah. yeah yeah that's the, I, that's a great approach to take that's like um cbt kind of level of um reaction where you you know you you take that internal conversation you have with yourself and actually acknowledge it and answer it and and tell it no i don't want that today you know i want you what's, to what's cbd cognitive behavioral therapy cbt cbt um, I think we're all capable of doing that though. I think we've just, you've just got to, I mean, my thing that I did was just um, in the moment, you can have your blinkers on and a feeling in the moment. But if you look at the wider, the wider arc of, you know, of how your journey is going, the things you've pulled off your trajectory and all that stuff. Um, that was, that's how I, um, just having faith in yourself, basically. Yeah. And, and having been through something like Moon, which was difficult and, you know, films are difficult to make, as you said, full stop, but going through something like that, how much of that prepared you for what was to come with with archive your your first feature well, all of it really because i mean myself and duncan were just working on everything all the way through and moon was no different <coughs> excuse me so you know moon was made with me and duncan at home basically so i'd like design everything we'd just be in our bedrooms with our computers and we'd kind of meet in the kitchen or the lounge and then talk about stuff go back to our bedrooms so you know we're working out the story in the lounge you know I'm, i've got some ideas for some moon based stuff i'm like hey come and have a look at this render and it's just what it was we're just going back and forwards um so it was weird because my kind of um role on moon it wasn't like a formal role where there's a job and i apply for a job and i get a job and then i've got a role and that's it it was just me and duncan just working on stuff like we always did so i'd be like oh, i'll do some graphics I'll, I'll design a set i'll do that okay i'll do the graphics for the screens that's fine um you know blah 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 oh, what do we need i'll oh, design some buggies that's fine i'll get that done oh we need a robot you know it's just that that's how we came together it was like oh we need this we need that we need that that'll be cool and it was it was it sounds scrappy but it was okay whilst it was scrappy because that was before we got in a production pipeline with a time scale so that was when before we'd got any money and before we were in anything had been blocked in a calendar once you get to that stage it's different like once you've got a studio booked and you know you're booking flights for your cast and all that kind of stuff and hotels and things it's all very different then you don't want to be scrappy at that point but you know because we had such a long a long lead into it all although when we got started on it, it all moved pretty quick and i mean most of the stuff that was in the film was the first version of stuff because I was just designing stuff and it was like, yeah, cool, here's Moonburst, yeah, cool, let's build it. It was all very straightforward. But it's because we knew each other and trusted each other really well and we'd done so much stuff before, all this kind of, it was all pitch stuff, it was just pitch, 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 pitch for all these promos and commercials and stuff, just endless pitch work. So working on a film was almost kind of luxurious because you're just doing one thing and you can just kind of sit on it and get it right. Mm. Yeah, I, I was listening to another interview you did where you were talking about being on the set in, in on, on Moon and you were just kind of walking around and just looking at the bits of the set that hadn't been shot on yet and you were just kind of like dirtying them up with a bit of coffee. Frantically and... trying to make them look <laughs> any way possible better, yeah. Yeah, and I wondered how like going on to film uh, archive where you're helming the project how difficult was it for you to sort of relinquish some of those responsibilities to, to other people on the crew? 
Or did you? Did you, were you still involved? Well, <clears throat> oh, still totally involved. But this comes up quite a lot. It's quite funny. I've I've heard this when I've been like doing interviews and press, but also just from friends, um, just saying like, because um, I do a bunch of different things, right? I do concept art, I do VFX work, I do graphic design, I do motion graphics, I do all anything visual in between. You know, I'll I build props and costumes and all sorts of stuff. So I just get in there and get stuff done. Basically, it's all it's all kind of one job to me. It's all kind of the same thing. Um, using different tools but it's all the same same thing like the same end goal like the same job so um yeah i had things <clears throat> even right back at the beginning you know i'm talking to my friends and they were like doesn't it feel weird like you know having somebody out in a we shot archive in budapest like having somebody out there building your set when you're not you know or doing this or doing that and it's like you know it's totally fine it's you know because this is how these things work right i'm going to do everything the thing is i do do i mean i do a lot of stuff on archive for sure like i did what i did on moon plus more on archive and you know you could say like you know should you have been doing all of that shouldn't you have just been directing but again it's all one job i wasn't neglecting directorial duties to go and do some graphic design you know that's just like fun so I'm in my hotel room at night, you know, I'll be out in Budapest on pre-production. <clears throat> I'll be in the studios all day. We'll be looking at through the set, talking to people about props, this, that, and the other, you know, testing, testing robot suits and stuff. Then I'll be back at home at night and I'll just open Photoshop and just put some music on and just do a lot of graphic design all night. You know, I know I've got it just how I want it. It's like nice and relaxing for me to do. Production doesn't have to pay for anything. You know, it's a total win-win. So, you know, it's up to you. When you're doing this stuff, it's up to you um you don't have to follow any rigid hierarchy or anything it's up to you i mean for me working as a director you know i do all these other things like i, I did the production design too um with a, another guy that i was working with and um i mean what i really need is like a bunch of art directors underneath me with their, their own teams to build stuff that's really the kind of optimal thing for me um i don't really need a production designer um i need a bunch of art directors so I probably need like about four art directors underneath me, I think, with their own teams, um, depending on what I'm working on. But and, and do you have you kind of strive to have a, a kind of filmmaking family, as it were? Like you know, the the people you work with on archive yeah. are they people that you want to take on to to other projects? Some are. I mean, yeah. it doesn't work out with everybody. No, of but um, yeah, some are. I mean, yeah. <clears throat> it's kind of frustrating because you know. I expect a lot from people when I'm working with them. I expect a lot from myself and I expect to deliver a lot. You know, I mean, we had a tiny budget for archive. It was like, it's comparable to Moon. So the two films are very much, um, very much comparable. Um, creatively too, I mean, you'll, I'm sure you've seen, you'll see echoes of the surround base in the architecture um, in archive. It's not coincidence. It's all very, very much on purpose. But, um, you know, yeah, I, I, I'm trying to I'm trying to get on and I, I work all the time and expect you know I expect a lot from people and some people are, are totally up for it some people are like up for the challenge some people are just naturally talented and everything that they kind of wave their hand across is just wonderful which is ace and some people are just happy to have a day at work which is totally fine I'll never begrudge anybody that but you know there might be times where stuff needs redoing because it's just not it's just not there yet you know, and it's getting late in the day and it's really kind of getting time to go home, but we need to sing tomorrow. And then you start, you know, you you never want to kind of get into that spot, but it's just inevitable on productions when you're trying to punch above your weight. You just end up in that position. Um, and so, yeah, you know, you can't begrudge somebody if they're going to go home. But this is another reason why it's good for me to be able to do things myself, because as long as I've still got some time left, I can do things myself. So I was picking up quite, even in post-production, I was picking up the effect shots and doing them at home and stuff like that. We run out of money in post. So I was doing a bunch of post-production at home and, yeah, all sorts of stuff. But the other thing I was going to say was I got real um, end of Blade Runner tingles when they're in the car together in the DeLorean with the trees going by and the music got a little bit Vangelis-y at one point. And I had proper, Stephen like... Stephen Price is a genius. He's great. Really good score, I thought, yeah. Yeah. No, Stephen Price is a, a legit genius. He's a keeper. Yeah, sure. he's, he's moving on to the next one. And did you... Um, when you first heard the score, what you know, what was your thoughts? What was your reactions? Well, honestly, when I heard that score, it was it was a a really really lovely memory hearing that score because um, 
what happened was, I mean, when I when I met Stephen, I mean, Stephen, you know, Stephen won the Academy Award for the score for Gravity in 2014, right? So, you know, and he came onto the project like he wanted to do it. Like the, the, the way he came onto the project, he asked me if he could do it. Like we didn't, I mean, we had like zero budget for it all. And I have a, a, a really nice friend, Yannick Lovo, who um, he worked at ILM at the time. And he'd read the script because he's like a trusted friend. So, you know, I'd given him the script to read. And his kids, um, he has two girls and Stephen's got two girls as well. And Stephen moved into the area and he, the kids started going to the same school. And they had, excuse me, they had an assembly and the teachers were saying, okay, um, you know, welcome our two new girls. Their daddy's, um, you know, won a, won a big award and won an Oscar in, in films. And so Yannick's girls went home and said, hey, dad, there's a couple of new girls at school and their dad's like won an Oscar. So Yannick's ears pricked up and he was like, oh yeah, who's this guy? Checked him out and it was Stephen. So Yannick, Yannick gave me a ring and it was like, I can't believe Stephen Price's girls just joined our school. Um, would you mind if I gave him the script to archive? You know, because you might, you might, you know, you might get some interest from him, might be able to, to work with him. And I was like, yeah, man, totally. So Yannick basically made it his business to collect up, collect his kids from school for a few days and, and introduce himself to Stephen. Got chatting with him, asked if he wanted to read a script. So Stephen said yes, fortunately. So Stephen read the script and it turns out he'd been doing all these like massive big studio films and he wanted to do a lower budget indie sci-fi film where he could just run away with it. So he asked me if he could do it and I was like, yeah, of course you can, that would be awesome. So yeah, Stephen asked, actually asked me if he could do Archive because I just got lucky and what I'd written was what he wanted to do. So he'd been looking for something like that. So that was another luck thing. So that got Stephen on board. And I mean, there was a couple of like, we, we, we talked about it quite a bit, but um, I just really was prepared to, for him to just do his thing and just, just see what he did. So he basically just took the script, went off and we kept in touch. He went out for beers a few times over the process of him writing. And he was just really happy with the way it was all going. Um, but we didn't, he didn't send us over any, any early stuff at all. We, we kept talking about it and I was like, I don't know, do you want to send me over any stuff? And he was like, I just want to keep working on it for a bit. And I was like, normally that's my big thing. It's like, I always want to see work in progress, but and something about Stephen, like he's a, well, when you when you actually meet him and get to know him, I just, you just trust him implicitly. So he was like the one person on the whole team of the project where I would be comfortable with him just keeping going and not sending me over any work in progress. Because the thing about that is that the way you get caught out with that is all jobs have got a deadline, right? You're making a film, you've got a deadline you've got to deliver for. So you come away from... Um, from your shoot, then you're editing, you're in post-production. Um, we had like a temp soundtrack that we slapped on to give things a bit of mood. The, um, my awesome editor, Adam Biskupski, very much another keeper. Um, he, uh, yeah, he put like a temp score to go listen to a bunch of stuff and, and um, had like a, a temp thing on to carry the mood. But um, Stephen was like, you know, I'm probably gonna just disregard this and, and do my own thing. I was like, yeah, man, whatever you gotta do, you go for it. Um, and so, Normally, when somebody doesn't show work in progress, that's a big problem for me because I've run enough teams in the past to know that quite often um, the way the way you get fucked on a job is pardon my French, but that's what happens. Yeah. You get fucked. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what happens is whatever's going on. Say you say you're like you're working on you're working on something and you've got to deliver it on a date. Um, you don't get any work in progress, and it's a hard date. There's no way you're going to go past it. The danger is they'll just kind of blat out the work at the last minute, give it to you at the last possible second. So you've got no opportunity to say, hang on a minute, I need to change some stuff. It's like you take what you're given, out the door, done. And it's the one way you get screwed in this stuff. And it's the same with everything. I mean, people do it with like, whether you're having a kitchen fit at all, whatever you're doing. I mean, the thing about a film is you've got a hard deadline um, where you've got to deliver and it's all contractual. You have to do that. Otherwise there's all kinds of penalties and bad stuff happens for everybody. So, you know, it, it would be, for example, you know, if someone was gonna like um, screw you with VFX, you just won't see any shots and they'll blast them all in in the last two weeks or something. And you're like, we need to change stuff. It's like, too bad you can't. Um, that's how you get fucked in post-production. So you have to see work in progress. It's the only way you know stuff's getting done. Um, and I've just, I've, I've, you know, I've been fucked enough in my career, pardon my French, but 
<laughs> just the word's just perfect for it because that's what yeah. happens you get fucked um and it can compromise the quality of the job and all kinds of stuff and as a director people look at the final result and they attach that as being your vision and that's your job is to make sure it is and if you've got all these people doing all this important work and they're not giving you a chance to have any input or direct any of it and it's like there you go you're out of time it can't be your vision it's their vision it can't be anything else or even worse usually when that kind of thing happens they're just blasting out a load of shit and they don't have any vision it's just a bunch of work they're grinding out they're just making sausages on a machine you know um and that can really really fuck you up frankly it'll ruin your film i'm sure all kinds of productions have been ruined or at least to some degree less or a large degree less than they should have been because you know a frustrated director and production team got fucked over by a last minute deliverable and not seeing work in progress and no opportunity to talk or redo things now like i say stephen was like pretty much the only person on the production who i trust to work like that and he said at the beginning the, the reason why i trusted him was because he understands this and he said to me right at the beginning don't worry i'm not going to fuck you by dropping a load of music at the end that we don't have any time to talk about <laughs> and i didn't even have to say that he said it yeah. to me and I was like, not only his reputation of just being a, a really lovely guy and just building my trust through getting to know him, but him saying that to me meant a lot because he knows the position I'm in. And the what he did was we were working, 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 and um, he was working for a long time before we got some work delivered. But he was writing music whilst we were shooting, and you know he was he'd been chipping away for a long time. So um, we were out in. Norway I did a when we were shooting in Budapest I didn't have a solution for um the house at the time because it was all going to be done in VFX so all the stuff with the house and the waterfall that was all originally going to be VFX but when we got back very quickly it was clear that um our VFX budget um was tightening up in places and you know it always happens so I was like look is it going to be helpful if I get a bunch of plates shot for this because I think it will and they were like yeah so I was like all right so it was a toss-up between Iceland or Norway, and we're watching the weather maps. Me, myself, uh, myself, producer Phil Hurd, and my editor, Adam Biskupski, ended up going out to Norway for three days. I took my drone, and Phil was driving us around in a hire car, and we're just going to wall it. We found a, I was looking, uh, in the ads found it, editor, um, he was using a, a stand-in clip from YouTube with a waterfall with like a plateau that he'd found in a Norwegian video, a uh, tourist information video thing um a travel blogger video or something and i saw that waterfall and i was like let's just use that you know it's just awesome we can cg the house in there so it's a place called manifossen in southern norway so we just jumped on an easy jet flight took my drone ads took his drone went out and just flew drones for three days around norway and whilst we were out there traveling around we went to manifossen shot the shit out of it and had it all basically in the first half day and we were there for three days so we we're like well let's just look on the tourist map, find any other waterfalls we can and just go and shoot them because we're here, we've got the drones, we've got the batteries, let's get it covered. So that's what we did. And whilst we're out there, Stephen dropped the music, first listened to the music, it was the first full run through. And yeah, we downloaded it and listened to it on an iPad in a car whilst we were driving across <laughs> Norway wow. and basically watched the film in the car, plugged into the Bluetooth speakers in the car. So it sounded great. Um, yeah, it was so good. So that was the first time I heard any music was in a hire car with Phil and Ads uh, driving through nowhere. Wow, so, with all that scenery so going by. <laughs> and it just blew us away. We were just like, fuck, this is just awesome. I mean, it barely changed from there. The, the only real thing that changed was that he'd done, he'd done his first pass with samples and then we recorded some live instruments like cello and stuff. And I'm sure he did a bunch of other work like mixing all kinds of stuff, but he, he basically just pretty much nailed it straight away. Yeah. Nice that, you know, you could put that trust in him in an area that you don't have expertise in as such. Um, yeah. I know what I like, but I'm not going to sit down and, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to hover over his keyboard and start pressing keys. Do you know what I mean? It's like, that's not, that's not the relationship I have with music. I need to really trust the people that I'm working with. Unfortunately, Mr. Stephen Price is somebody that you can trust. <laughs> There you go. Put website address comes along the bottom of the screen right now. Oh, he's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you say it's small budget, but it looks fantastic. I've watched it uh, two and a half times now. I didn't get around to finishing it a third time. Um, but uh, I think it looks fantastic. I, I'm, I, the reason for that is I was doing a bit more research and uh, 
unfortunately my wife's just had a bit of surgery so I'm sort of doing everything at the moment um, but I will watch it that third time um, what what really struck me about it is you know any good sci-fi that I kind of grew up on whether it was in comics or whether it was in novels or, or films it's always about the human character and the sort of human condition and even your you know your robot characters have got real personality you know J1 I think is just fantastic it reminds me of I work in the television industry and it reminds me of some of those giant pieces of camera kit we used to have when I first started kind of 20 years ago you know that have got all these kind of slightly rounded edges but they're just big kind of beige boxes and you know you you do apply personality to to these to these things where did you look for for inspiration like what was your inspiration for the robots in in your film um did you look back to, to the 70s and 80s yeah I always wanted people in suits yeah. Just because, uh, well, firstly, we couldn't afford to do anything else. I can't afford like all CG robots and stuff. So if these robots have to be CG, they're not in the film, basically. I had you know. to check, you know, I did have to check. I was. Well, that's cool. I appreciate that. Yeah. I was after the first viewing, I, I had, a, you know, I thought, I think, I think they're maybe 50 50 or something like that. And I had, I had to look up and uh, realize that they were all. There's basically CG suits. in there. Yeah. I mean, there's, I don't know if we're into spoilers or not, but J2 becomes partly CG towards the end of her um, story. Yes. And obviously J3's got quite a bit of CG in there. Yeah. Yeah, J2's in the story. I'm not going to leave this in the podcast, but that was a, that was, wow, what a moment that was. <laughs> did That's I get real, you? Real, It <laughs> did, man. It did. It did. Um, yeah, I was welling up a couple of times actually watching it. Um, and I, I don't know, there's just something about, Sci-fi should always ask a question, shouldn't it? And you've asked that question about what would you do if you were in that situation? And that's what me as an audience member is thinking. Like, Christ, if my wife died, would I would I want to have that opportunity? Would I would I seek well, that? Well, I think out? the thing is about that. I like I mean, like what you said before about you know stories about um people. I I feel the same about that. Like the, the most compelling sci-fi for me is when you take people and put them in some kind of sci-fi, use some kind of sci-fi conceit to put some kind of a spin on something that you'd understand in your own life and it spin it off into some kind of futuristic um, scenario. So when I was putting the story together, I wanted to have a, I like sci-fi films with stakes that you can buy into because so much sci-fi is about saving the earth and this, that and the other, which is cool, but I like things that are a bit closer in. So I chose the themes of love and death, thinking that they're just fundamental aspects of the human condition that we're all going to have um, experiences with them in some form or another so if I write a story about love and death any, everyone's going to be able to hook into that so, to some degree you know so um, hopefully it'll let me kind of catch people a little bit pull them into the story so the story was all written back in 2011 it was like a long time ago when I had that together um, it just took a long time to get the film together but so I set out to tell a story about love and death and loss um, through through and loss and death, replacement naturally came through as a theme, which I thought was quite interesting. Maybe that's the thing we're all really scared of, really yeah. deep inside. Yeah, I think we probably are. Oh, I, I love that idea that, you know, we something that could be created by human and artificial life that wants to take its own life, you know. I think that's a fascinating well, idea. Well, that was the original, the original nugget was that. I mean, you've mentioned a thing before about how when you're putting a project together, usually it comes from some idea, right? And what I kind of found now that I'm working as a writer, I found that you can have an idea, but it's not necessarily a story. So the idea and story can be kind of separate. But the idea of a machine wanting to die was the original idea that kicked off the whole process. That was the first idea that I had. Um, I write all my ideas down in my phone. So, yeah, I've got this, like, in there from, like, um, 2011, October, I think, 2011. Um, yeah, I was at home in my flat, and I had a couple of, um, there's some weird power surge that happened, I don't know. Both my computers, both my PCs died, and I, I had a really awful time. I couldn't, um, I had to get the data retrieved, and it cost a couple of thousand quid to get that done. It was bad. Um, and the computers were just stone dead, like, they ended up getting recycled, like, I couldn't get them fixed. So whatever happened, it was pretty bad. Um, and yeah, I was in the middle of a spring clean whilst I was doing that. It was on a weekend, it was on a Sunday. And I'd got to that awesome part of the spring clean where you've trashed your house. You know, where you've got to like make it messy before you can make it tidy yeah. again. I was in the peak mess. Then this thing happened and I was like, how was that? Computers are off. Everything just blinks off. And it's like, hmm, obviously. But anyway, 
bad, bad, bad. Couldn't do anything to fix it. Had to keep charging up my house. I was just super pissed off. And I felt hard done to. I felt wronged. You know, I felt like this this was being done to spite me. Right. And I felt like my computers had killed themselves to spite me, just to <laughs> give me a big problem, piss me off. And there's something about that idea that I liked that kind of lodged in my mind and just kind of because I was looking for I had another conversation going with a production um, production company who were asking me if I had anything I wanted to make into a film so I was thinking about ideas for something that might be worth pursuing around that time anyway so that was the idea was what if uh, that quickly developed into the idea of what if um, you built a, a human equivalent AI machine and as soon as you turned it on it just killed itself which then started to lead into a story as in like, you know, why is that happening? How can you stop it? And that, so that was for archive, that was how the idea became the story. Um, but the idea was, yeah, a, a machine wanting to die, wanting to kill existence. And that then manifests through all kinds of other things. Me taking that idea and that nugget of a story, trying to find a story around the things of love and, and death. And I mean, you can see from there very quickly, it took about six weeks, it just kind of went ding, 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 and the stories worked out. But then it took me another, yeah, however many, nine years to get it shot and finished. Wow, nine years. When did you, how, what was the actual shooting period? How long, how, long, how long did that take? You said it was out in Budapest, right? Yeah, we were in Budapest. Um, let's see. We shot in a warehouse because you can't get any studios out there because all the streaming services have block booked all the studios from now till infinity. So if you look, you get a nice warehouse and, and you know put up with that um what was it 27 days really yeah I think it's 27 28 days oh. i'll say 28 and we had a, we had a contingency day we use so yeah 28 days and, and why budapest what was the attraction there yeah i mean ultimately the shooting um location is determined by finance so it's not like they come to me and say hey guy what films you what country you want to go to, to shoot your film well, that'd be awesome but that doesn't happen um, it's all to do with like um, tax incentives and breaks and things like yeah, that. Yeah. Complicated mathematics and finance stuff that I don't want to get involved in because that's why I'm a producer. They can deal with all of that. Um, you know, I'll, I'll keep myself focused on the creative stuff. But yeah, I was swinging into it. I mean, it all came together at the last minute. In the last kind of six weeks, I think it was before we nailed uh, Hungary as a locate as a country to shoot in. We went through about seven different locate different countries. It was. There's Italy at one point, uh, Belgium, South Africa, uh, Melbourne in Australia was in at one point, which would have been a bit of a bit of a bitch for pre-production. But my girl was Australian, so we have made it work. Although I did have a thing I said I wanted to do to myself, um, with to, to myself, the thing I wanted to do, if we ended up shooting, if I ever get to shoot a film in um, Australia, I'm going to get myself an old '70s Ford Falcon, like the Mad Max car. Yeah. And I want to, I want to dry, I want to do a little tour of the Mad Max locations in a Ford Falcon. Nice, nice. But I never got to live that dream um, on this one. Well, I mean, Budapest but yeah, it's is all, a, it's all money. Budapest is a pretty good second to Melbourne, I'd say. I've had some uh, some good times That's in both it. those cities over the years. Yeah, Budapest yeah. is top top town. Um, yeah. You finished the film in February 2020. Is that right? Yeah. Just before I mean, the pandemic shut So down. fortunate. I mean, yeah. so so <laughs> lucky. I mean, obviously you would have liked a cinema release, but I guess in some ways, given that everybody's at home, kind of chewing their way through every bit of you know content they yeah, can. Finishing maybe, Netflix. Yeah, 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 like complete. Um, you know, do you think have you got any measure of the you know how many sets of eyes you've had on on archive? Do you get that kind of information? I get bits and pieces at certain periods in time. I know that everybody's happy. <clears throat> Excuse me. My my only real main thing is like are the finances happy? Because you know I'm I'm proud of stuff. Like we finished archive um, on time and under budget, right? We, for an ambitious film like like it is, you know everyone was very happy when we delivered the film, which you know makes me happy because you know I just want to be a, a, a good scoreboard at the end of the day. <laughs> you know it's all well and good working with all these business people, but I genuinely want them to be happy at the end of the day. Um, and it, it's really cool when like, you know, your financiers are like taking you out for a big meal and asking you what you're doing next and asking if they can be a part of it and all that stuff. It's really cool. And it means a lot to me that, you know, because I'm trying to I'm trying to do it right. And I don't think I'd be having those kind of conversations if I wasn't doing something right. So, you know, I'll keep pushing that. But, you know, it, it means a lot to me that I know ultimately it's business and everybody's doing business. And the only reason why 
anyone's investing in like archive is because it, they think it represents a viable business opportunity. But even so, it still means a lot to me personally that they chose to support me and yeah. and and go with um, go with my my thing, right? My my pitch, my job, my creative endeavor. That still means a lot to me. So even though they're doing it, looking at mathematical equations and balance sheets, it still it still means a lot to me personally. No. Yeah, I can totally see that, and I'm, I would imagine like in the same way that or a similar way that Moon opened up opportunities and doors i would imagine that archive is now you know because it's been seen by so many people and it's available on so many different platforms that you are getting offers and you're getting i'm, I'm assuming you you know you have a representative that's kind of seeking out projects for you and you're probably being yeah know, the, the fun part of our conversation where i can't tell you anything yeah yeah i, <laughs> I bet. got loads i got i got some great stuff going on right now wow. but i Fantastic. can't talk about it I'm yeah no worries no, I got I got signed by CAA out in LA, Blimey. which are like the yeah. yeah they're like right at the top of the pile with the creative agencies out there. Fantastic. So they're awesome. I've got a couple of um, a couple of agents working for me out there representing me who are just great. I mean, and I have um, a UK agent too, at Casarotto, who's just a lovely chap. And between the three of them, um, yeah, we've all been like combining forces. I've been one of the things that has been good with the creative. Uh, sorry, the the pandemic an unexpected um, boon for my kind of career at the moment, which is like useful and I'll, I'll take it as a win through luck, is um, everyone's accepted Zoom and video conferencing as a standard way of meeting now. So I've been able to do all my uh, meets and greets in LA over Zoom. Now, it would have been cool to go out. Normally you'd go out to LA, you'd hang out there for a couple of weeks, rack up a load of meetings, go and have a load of nice lunches, you know, a few drinks, which would have been great. And I will get around to doing that when yeah. this is all, you know, behind us and we can travel safely and everyone's healthy and good. But in the meantime, it's been really cool just getting plugged into LA over Zoom because, you know, I've just been able to just have video conferences and I've just got to meet everybody out there, which is just awesome. Um, so, yeah, I've got um, five projects I'm working on at the moment, which are all at various stages, um, which I can't talk about, but I've never been busier never been more creatively stimulated uh never been more excited honestly about the stuff um that i'm hoping to be able to bring you to watch hopefully well you absolutely deserve it gav i'm i'm, I'm really pleased that that's happened because you you really do deserve it i i think you know your work on moon was very inspirational for a lot of people in the same way that you know we were inspired by the people that worked on Alien. I always think, you know... Oh, it's nowhere like, near the same, honestly. I appreciate what you're saying. But. No, but listen, like, you know, I can see... I can look at your stuff I and I can see a through line a from, you know, like Ron Cobb designing all of that stuff on Great. Alien, you know, and all the symbols for the doors and things and just the way you've kind of, you know, analysed that and you've pulled it apart and you've rebuilt your own version of it, you know, and I think that's fantastic that that sort of legacy, that legacy remains and... I think that the fact that you're just forging forward is, is fantastic because, you know, I've been aware of you on Twitter for, well, what do we think it is now? 12 years or something we've been yeah. on Twitter. Um, and, um, you know, I followed, I followed what you're doing. And as soon as I saw the archive was on the horizon, you know, there was a little kind of, you know, fist pump moment for you. I thought, oh, that's great. He's getting his own chance to do Thanks, this. Um, and I really hope you get to do like something, maybe a series. Who knows what one of these five projects is, you know? I, w I would love to see Maybe. You, know, you do we'll something see. longer form. I mean, do, do you find that an attractive prospect? Because obviously with a film, you've got that kind of two-hour window to tell a story and you have to have that certain efficiency. But with something longer form, you get that time to sort of let things play out and, and develop. Is that attractive? Yeah. I mean, one of the things about me particularly working creatively is that because I come from... I've been working in the games industry since like '96. And I originally trained as, a, as a, an illustrator and a graphic designer and wanted to do comics. So excuse me, my, um, my background is as much in computer games as it is in film and advertising and sort of VFX. So yeah, I've just, I've got all this kind of, I've got all these like miles of road behind me with all this stuff that I've done. And the thing is about games is it's all about world building. Like, you know, that's what you're doing there, you're world building. And in a, when you're making a game, the level of world building that you have to do in a game to, to nail it is so much greater than the level of world building you have to do in a, a production. Or it feels like that to me anyway. Um, 
you know, when you're making a game, you've got a, you, you can go anywhere, walk and, you know, you can explore. I mean, one of the things I love about games is traveling to the environments. It's one of the reasons why I love VR so much. It's just the, the, the experience of, of being to a, one of these like kind of fantastic places that never really existed. It's, it's like alien isolation. I can wander around those ships endlessly. You know, they're just beautiful. The environments yeah. are beautiful. Yeah. But you've got to realize the entire thing in a game, whereas on in a in a film, in a movie, you've got the frame to deal with. And so I'm always thinking about the rest of the world because that's the way I've been working for the last 25 years. That's my whole thing. So to be able to do that in film, it's funny because I've found people comment on it quite a lot. To me, it's just second nature, like the whole world building thing. But on sets, I'll have all these little things that I'm putting in there that are there for reasons that are outside the scope of the script. But, you know, there's the, they're there for a good reason because of the, the broader context of the world. And it was so cool having people pick up on a lot of this stuff. And, yeah, the world building thing something that I'm really fond of. And for me, world building film off television is so much more luxurious than world building for games because, like I say, you've got the frame. And especially now I'm working as a writer, I can properly get things down like I can look at things like lore and things like that and backstories and stuff like and I can really get into that so what, I, what I'm trying to do at the moment with um, when I'm working on film projects like two of them in particular that I'm working on there's all this lore and backstory around them so if they were I'm, I'm pitching them as film projects and writing movie scripts but there's also um, like a, a supplementary document which would outline how that would transfer to television if right. it was felt that was a, a way that anybody wanted to go. And because the worlds are all realized, there's all kinds of opportunities for exploration. So I'm just, I'm not writing a bunch of TV episodes, but I'm just outlining things and hinting at where directions it could go off on and how things that are in this, in this film could sort of ping off into their own little timelines or crossover or, you know, bring other, other things in that are touched on in the, in the movie that could be their own, a, a much bigger thing in a, a longer format. So it's yeah. really fun to do. I mean, there's one in particular that I do, which is a sci-fi comedy. And I'm working on it with my old um, comic partner, uh, a chap called Steve Tag. Our whole creative process is basically us trying to make some, trying to make a, a compelling, awesome sci-fi story, but also just make each other laugh. I think this is the thing about work. There's a couple of different types of work, in my opinion, when you're working professionally, because, you know, if, you, if you're working in some artistic or creative field, that's cool. You know, you, it's probably something that comes from your youth that you were doing because you enjoyed it and were good at it and, you know, all of that. But then when you start working professionally, you're in an industrial environment. And oftentimes you're not the one who you're like at some point down a food chain and you've been told what to do and you've been briefed. And it's like, can you give us this? Can you give us that? And so even though you're doing your own thing, you're kind of fighting to put your creativity into someone else's vision a lot of the time. Do you know what I mean? So to get to the point where you're doing something and you're not doing that after doing that for a long, 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 long time is really thrilling. And I find there's two types of work in, in your career when you're working professionally. There's a type of work that tires you out the more you work. And there's another type of work, which is usually the same thing, but maybe a different project, where the more you work, the more energized you get. So working hard on it actually gives you energy and gets you excited and gets you pumped. So one type of work drains you and leaves you ready for bed. And the other type of work just gets your brain spinning and leaves you all, all excited and, and kind of pumped for it. And so I've always, my kind of benchmark myself for when I'm trying to do one of my own projects is I have to, I have to get that pumped feeling when I'm working on it rather than it feeling like any kind of a grind. There's always grind here and there, but it needs to be something where the more I work on it, the more excited I get about it. And probably one of the most fun, I mean, writing this script has just been fun the whole way through, but writing this other document to like sort of try and give a little bit of a, an outline as to what it might become if it were to become a, a series on a TV series. It's just one of the most fun things I've ever written, just thinking about it, because we've got this cool little universe that we've built and there's so much potential for, for oh, it's so cool if they had, what if, and you know, all that kind of stuff. And it's just, it's just a TV episode right there. Like looking at, you know, the content. Anyway, I'll stop talking about all this. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, you should. I'll get all excited and blurt out what's going on. <laughs> that sounds like great though. Ships. Yeah, 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 that's it. Well, I think, um, 
yeah, I, I'm sure everyone that's listening will, you know, wish you the best, Gav, because I think um, if you if you continue to make these projects at the improvement arc that you're on at the moment, like with everything you do, it just seems to get better and better. And I, I honestly wish you wish you the best <laughs> no, for these projects. It's, yeah, it's uh, I'll be watching with great interest, definitely.